coming. I'm Stephen Ming, the name with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And they say, honored to come to speak with you. And today we're going to be speaking again about the two witnesses, also the identity of the Antichrist. It's not a long message, it's a rather short message, but it's something that the Lord has shown me once again. Uh, scriptural evidence, scriptural passages where God Himself has identified who these people are who the two witnesses are. It is literally sitting right before your face in the Bible who the two witnesses are going to be. Not a mystery. It's just a matter of God opening your eyes to see what they, who, they, who they are. A lot of debate over that, but we're going to set, uh, hopefully settle some of that debate for you today. As well, I'd like to mention, I stirred up a hornet's nest once again about the issue of women. And not that it stirred it up so much with women. Of course, it does with some. But uh, there's a lot of men that have been upset with me about this. You've, <clears throat> I've read your comments, and uh, I appreciate your, your, your thoughts and your stand. Also, there are some people that have asked, why do we even read the King James Bible then if it's not accurately translated? Well, one thing's for sure. When it comes to salvation, your accuracy is there. It's, it's not that it's not there, but you have to remember translators are not prophets. They're not inspired of God necessarily. Many of those were paid to actually do what they did, and they translated according to whatever authority wanted them to translate the documents to. And of course, not everybody can read Hebrew, nor could they read Koine Greek, etc. But you know, God does say you know, search out your own salvation with trembling and fear. Not just read everything and just believe everything that that's the way it is. We have to search it out. But let me just say this before we get into the two witnesses once again. And by the way, that's another interesting thought. If the Bible says that Elijah will restore all things, then certainly something must not be exactly right. And if Christianity is perfect, as far as what we're looking at written, not because of what the apostles wrote or Paul, their words were perfect, but it's what the translators did with their words a little later on after they wrote it. <clears throat> so therefore, this is where the scruples all come in, and it's our duty before God to search out these matters. Now, real quick, before I get started on the two witnesses, and, and, and that'll kind of help also help understand this thing about the Bible, uh, you must understand those of you that have wrote me and said that uh, uh, Paul actually said this, that women are to remain silent, notice he quotes in there as, uh, uh, he's quoting this as a law that is actually given. Now, my challenge to any man out there is find to me in the law, which is the Torah, find to me where God said for women to remain silent and they're to learn from their husbands at home. You're not going to find it. It's not in the law. This is why I said to you, you're not paying attention to what Paul says when he questions it. What? Did the word of God come out of you only? Now you're seeing where the law is coming from. He's actually showing you where the law comes from. It's coming out of them. It's coming out of the Pharisaic traditions, and they call this the oral law. Well, the oral law, by the way, is a Talmudic is what has been written in the Talmud. And we have two Talmuds, the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. Neither one of them were ever written in Jerusalem. But the problem, even as, as pointed out by Nehemiah Gordon, is that there's so much inconsistencies. One writer there disagrees with the other. There's not a continuity such as what you have in the Bible. So therefore, how can we say this is really the law of Moses? Moses' words that God gave to him that were pinned down they do not contradict one another. So therefore, those that are teaching that women are to remain silent in the churches, as also saith the law, you're teaching a Talmudic tradition. You're teaching Talmud, something that probably many of you speak against in the first place. Because I challenge you to find anywhere where God ever says for her to remain silent. The only place in your margin refers to Genesis 3.16, which again is mistranslated as far as because of the Christian people mistranslating that. You have to understand, the Jewish people who speak Hebrew, they know exactly what it does mean. They realize, whether they want to admit it or not, that it is prophetic. God says to her, Tushutecha, you will turn to your husband 
and he will rule over you because she turned to a man that has fallen, that has lost the Holy Spirit as a result. So therefore he goes to carnality. This is the reason why I challenge you. Produce the law that says women are to remain in silence and learn from their husbands at home. If you can produce a biblical law from Moses' writings, 663, which not one of them says that, then I will say you're right. But if you're just going to only produce a Talmudic tradition, I will do as Paul did with you. With you, I will do the same as Paul did to the Pharisees of his day. Did the word of God come from you only? Then maybe you might begin to do some serious research. This is not something that wasn't written in the Bible already or translated correctly at one time. The question is, is whether or not you're willing to look at the correct translations even the Septuagint translated it right. Interesting, isn't it? All right, let's get on and move to the issue of the two witnesses, something that the Lord began to deal with me on. I say this because I know there's a lot of questions out there about uh, the women, and women are just getting beat up constantly because the first thing men do, they don't even pay attention to what the Word of God is saying and what is Right? It's, it's Actually, by the way, this is all at your own fingertips. All you have to do is just do a little research. You can find out for yourself. Um, and But no one wants to really do the research. They just want to quickly go back and say, Paul said this and Paul said that. You have no idea the way Paul wrote. Paul's writing letters, answering questions. But what he does is he includes the question. It was included at the margin or the bottom of his pages there. Actually, some of the ancient... The translators, that's the way they did it. They put the question that was asked in a margin area. And so what they have done now in modern times is they've included the question in the text as if Paul is actually saying it. There's other things also in some of the ancient uh, translations of the Greek language where they show the markings that Paul used to show it as quotations. It's like two dots, almost like quotation marks today, but we have like two commas at the top. Paul actually used two dots to show that it was a quotation. It was being a question that was being asked, and he was answering it. So, you know, the sad thing is the church just doesn't want you guys knowing these things. Oh, well. Nonetheless, let's go to, uh, I want to take you in the Word of God here. Let's see if I can find where I was at here on this. Um, and... I thought I marked everything, but I guess I did not mark it. So I've got to find it. Take one quick pause. All right, here we go. We're in John chapter 5. And we're going to take you to verse, starting with verse 39 to the conclusion of the chapter here. I want you to listen carefully to this. Jesus says, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. Search, excuse me, and you will not come to me that you might have life. Hmm. But I know you that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. That's a scripture right there that really caught my attention. If another come, in his own name, him you will receive. He's speaking of only one man, not a group. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Think about that one just for a moment. Think about the current situation in Israel. Think about who keeps interceding on the behalf of Jerusalem for the peace agreement and think of the honor that they bestow on one another. I'll give you some pictures here to look at as we contemplate this idea. <clears throat> Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. Now, this is interesting because here Yeshua is identifying one of the two witnesses. Now I know the next verse is here. He's going to take it from the past and he's going to show in his writings. But he's actually speaking of the coming second witness here, just as he speaks of Elijah as well. 
He says, I'll read it again. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. Now, he says this immediately after he says, and um, how can you believe what you receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God? Where he, in verse 43, he identifies it, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses. Now see, God, here, here Yeshua was standing right there, and he says, I won't be the one to accuse you. It'll be Moses that accuses you. That's when they go to receive this other man that comes in his own name, the one that bestows honor upon one another, as if there's someone great. You know what's funny? The Pope of Rome actually is supposedly in the place of Christ. Yet the Jews never would accept Yeshua as being the one that Moses wrote about. But this man here who claims to be in the place of Christ, yes, you do receive him because why? He came in his own name and he so bestows honor upon you and you bestow honor upon him. Is that not right? Yes, I speak to all of the leaders of Israel. Prime Minister Netanyahu has made the same mistake. No wonder why Zippy Livni accuses him of being fearful. Sure, he's fearful because he knows in his heart something is wrong. Shimon Perez, he's nothing but a Jesuit anyway, so therefore it's easy for him to bestow honor upon the Pope, the man that has come in his own name. You receive him. He is supposed to be the representative of Christ. Well, even Jesus says he's not, and I'm going to show you where it comes out. Let's go to see what Jesus con concludes with this. For, remember now, he says Moses is going to be the one that accuses you. The one whom you trust. <clears throat> Verse 46, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. Now he's dealing with the day he's living in. For he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Hmm. You know, for Moses to accuse them, Moses has to return. It's interesting. He does future, present, and past when he writes about Moses on this. Now, let's see where Moses actually writes of Yeshua. It's a scripture very well known to everyone, but let's just see what Moses writes. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from, a, from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, liken unto me, unto him you shall hearken. Now, there's a reason why God has to do it. Let's see what he says. According to all that thou desiredest of the Lord thy God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord thy, my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. Moses writes about a prophet that's going to raise up, and he says he's doing this because of your own desire. He said, Let only Moses speak. Well, see, Moses was just a man. He couldn't stick around to continue to say this to you for the next, oh, what, 1,500 years or so? So he says, the Lord thy God will raise up from among your brethren a prophet. And this is what's interesting, because they did not want to hear the voice of God nor see that fire again. So God put that fire and that voice inside a man called Yahshua. Jesus of Nazareth, as he's known according to the English-speaking people. Now, let's see what they say. And the Lord said, notice, they even ask, neither let me see this great fire anymore that I die not. And the only way that you could get out of the death was to have this light and this fire to come in a human being to take away the sins of the world, which was Yeshua. And so he does it. He fulfills it as Jesus is saying, Moses wrote of me and you believe me not. 
And he goes on to say, And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. Because God knew that he had to come and redeem man and how he had to do it. So he knew they had to say it. This is what's interesting. God knew that they had to reject the way he was coming. Because there was only one way to do it. And that was through a kinsman redeemer. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren. Like unto thee. And will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet, ah, watch what he says, because Yeshua refers to the same guy that comes in another name. And you'll bestow honor upon him. Now Moses writes about him too. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods. Even that prophet shall die. It's interesting because the Pope of Rome has become a prophet to the world. And he's going to prophesy that what they're doing will bring peace and safety to the world when they take control of Jerusalem. Something I'm sure Miss Livney will hand to him on a silver platter. Kind of question whether or not she's really Jewish herself. Maybe she comes from a Jesuit family, much like Shimon Perez. <sighs> okay. And he says he'll die. Of course he'll die. The Bible says that after the death of the two witnesses, when the world rejoices, God will destroy that Pope and his city and the people therein. So yes, he does die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know that the word which the Lord has spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. Well, Yeshua came, and everything he said came to pass. Now you have your new prophet, Israel. You have chosen the Pope of Rome. And you've given him a seat at King David's tomb. Now I know there's a lot of Jewish people that oppose this. God bless you for taking that stand and standing for God. You will see that he will falsely prophesy that it will bring peace and safety with his new world order. And God will take and strike him dead. But it looks like the two witnesses will come on the scene. As I said, Yeshua clearly has identified one as being Moses. You don't realize that at first because it just looks like he's doing it as a historical thing. But notice again, verse 42 in John's Gospel, 5th chapter. But I know you that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. He prophesied that you would accept this agreement with this man that has come to broker this peace. And the Pope of Rome is the one that you bestowed the honor on. No, you've not bestowed any honor on John Kerry or any of the other ones there. Everybody that says, oh, Obama's the Antichrist, oh, John Kerry, or whatever you want to call them, all of them that you've never bestowed honor upon them, but you have lavished honor upon the Pope of Rome. Yes, you have. And likewise, he's lavished honor upon you into his own little cathedral of castle of pagan worship, serving other gods. And yes, he does, because he brought the gods of Egypt with him. Exactly what he did. How can you believe what you receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. No, he doesn't accuse anybody because at that time Yeshua knows that he would not be there when this happens. There is one that accuseth you. He knows who will be there at that time, even Moses in whom you trust. He shows they were still trusting in Moses when all this takes place. And Moses will come and accuse them for what they're doing. Let me follow up with the other witness where Jesus clearly identifies him in the book of Matthew. This also is an agreement with the Hebraic version of Matthew's gospel that we have public before us. 
Matthew 17, verse 9, And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. And by the way, what happened on Mount Tabor there in Israel? I've actually been there. The Lord, you know, maybe, not, maybe I've never told you about this before. In 2004, when I was coming across uh, the, the valley there, the Jezreel Valley, we were looking. There were mountains everywhere. I was there with a tourist guide. And with the tourist guide, there were, I think, three or four other people in the car with me. I'm just sitting there quietly in the back looking. It was the first time I'd been to Israel. And as I looked across the valley, I saw this one mountain. And the Lord spoke to my heart and told me, this is where Moses and Elijah came down and met Yeshua face to face. And I'm thinking all the hundreds of mountains around me you know, I say hundreds, I don't know. Maybe you can see 40, 50 peaks all around you because they're everywhere, mountains everywhere. And the Lord just speaks to my heart and tells me this is where that happened. And I thought, that's strange. Well, about five minutes later, the tourist guide says, the mountain before you as we're coming up, because then we were at that point, we we're in a direct line headed on the road. He says, that mountain is Mount Tabor. It is the traditional spot, as he said, where Moses and Elijah met Jesus. I thought that was very interesting. Anyway, Matthew here speaks about that. And of course, remember, on either side of the golden lampstand were the two olive trees, which represent the two witnesses. Here, the olive branch, the very root of the olive tree itself, the candle stick itself, the main one that has the oil, is standing with either side, the two olive branches, Moses and Elijah. So they ask him the questions, his disciples, as they're coming down. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias, which is Greek for Elijah, Elijah truly shall first come. Now, he puts it in the future. Keep in mind, when Jesus is saying this, John the Baptist is already dead. He's not alive at this point. And, see, he shall first come and restore all things. In the future, Elijah comes and restores all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already, and they knew, knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then he looks to the fulfillment of Malachi 4, only half of the verse of John, where he come to turn the heart of the fathers to the children. The heart of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was to see the Messiah. So God gave them the Messiah by John the Baptist introducing the Messiah. He fulfilled the heart of the fathers, handing them the Messiah as a witness. It's interesting. He witnessed that he was the Messiah, but Jesus put the Elijah coming also in the future where he restores all things. And of course, over here in the book of John, we find out he sends Moses to accuse Israel of her sins, to point out the sins of Israel. Elijah will come to restore the word. Interesting. You know, the Bible says that they will take hold of the skirt of a Jew. That's something. Let's look this up real quick. Zechariah chapter 8. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Interesting, isn't it? Him that is a Jew. Don't know if that applies to one of the two witnesses. Or maybe it applies to Israel. 
because the two witnesses have come and restored all things. You see, in the Hebraic language, the Jewish people have been very faithful in keeping the purity. The church had a hard time doing anything with what was written to us. Of course, when the canonization was, had come and they were trying to keep the Jews silenced, there's many books that are myth, missing out of the Bible. We know that because even in Chronicles, many of the books are spoken about. The book of Nathaniel, the book of Asa, and other books as well that is mentioned in the book of Chronicles. The different prophets that were there that mysteriously we don't seem to have those canonized as part of the scripture. Anyway, I thought these would be some things for you to think about today. I'm Stephen Bendenoon. God bless you. God bless you from the East, huh? and good day.